Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we are reviewing Anti-Fragile by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, Things That Gain From Disorder. And this is a nice follow-up from The Black Swan, a book we did uh, six or eight months ago by Nassim Taleb, all about uh, random events that happen in the world. And anti-fragile, I guess, is a bit of an answer to that or how it can capitalize on it. It's an absolute slog to get through, but it's got some serious gold in there. The takeaways are as good as anything you'll get from most books really out there. And as an example or a metaphor that he uses to kick off the book, he says, a wind extinguishes a candle, but it energizes a fire. And likewise, with randomness, uncertainty and chaos, you want to be able to use them for your advantage and you don't want to hide from them. So you want to be the fire that actually gets lit up by the wind and the one that just doesn't get blown out. Yeah, exactly. If you're fragile, it means if bad things happen, you're easily broken. And most people might think, okay, well, I don't want to be fragile, so I want to be robust. I want to be resilient, which is if in that case, if bad things happen, you're not affected by it. But Nassim says that's not really the opposite of fragile. That's like something. That's like somewhere in the middle. The opposite of fragile would be anti-fragile, which is when bad things happen, you actually get better as a result. And so that's what we want to be uh, aiming for: is anti-fragility. If you're at the airport and you got your little your little wine glasses in a box that uh, needs to go overseas, you're going to put the word or put the tape on it saying fragile, right? You don't want anyone to mishandle it and, and touch it. And as you're saying, if you thought what the opposite of this would be, a lot of people say robust, mean, meaning it doesn't really break. But really, the opposite of negative is positive. It's not neutral. And there really isn't a word out there to describe the opposite of fragility. So this is what it captures in the book. It is the opposite of fragility, something where you're actually asking to be mishandled because you're actually going to gain from from this. Yeah, I know that that sticker at the airport. I don't think it does too much, man. I reckon they'd still chuck your wine glass around anyway. Yeah. But in theory, in theory, it makes sense. So that's the idea behind it. That's the theory behind it. Next, he brings in a few examples to illustrate this idea. And one, he talks about Greek mythology. And I think most people would understand the phoenix, you know, that cyclically regenerates every time it dies and it's, it's born again, it rises from the ashes. So you might think that you want to be like the phoenix, but really the phoenix is just robust in that anytime something bad happens, it comes back the same as it was. So it's it's not affected by bad things, but it's just it's robust. There's another character from Greek mythology who you want to be a bit close to. I think this is taken from this was in like the stories of Hercules, where Hercules would have the sword and then this um, this character called Hydra, which is like a serpent like creature that dwells in the in the lake of Lerner, it says. And what it has, it has comes out of the lake with numerous heads. And every time you chop one of its heads off, it grows back too. So every single time you think you're making progress is actually getting worse with the, the more stress that is being put, in, put onto this creature. Yeah, so you want to be like the Hydra. When something bad happens, you actually benefit from it. So if your head gets chopped off, you get two heads back. And so a few things like perhaps in uh, your personal life, that are closer towards this level of anti-fragility might be admitting that you don't know something rather than pretending that you know that's actually really fragile because if you if you're pretending that you you know something and you don't know it you're really susceptible to a lot of downside there but if you admit that you don't know then you've got an opportunity to learn something absolutely so when you say you don't know something you might look like a bit of an idiot in the short term and like hydra one of your heads might be cut off but by cutting that head off you're leaving room for another two heads to grow up because you're actually going to learn something new. Another one might be getting outside your comfort zone or you know, trying something like public speaking or networking, sending someone that you've never met before a message and saying that you want to get together. Very uncomfortable things. There's a bit of risk there that it might not work, but at the same time, you're exposing yourself to a hell of a lot of upside. Another thing that really likes anti-fragility is Mother Nature. So if Mother Nature was just safe and robust, it really wouldn't be evolving past and to into new life forms. But what it does, it lets the weak life forms die off just to contribute to the better to an overall species for something new and better to emerge in the future. Yeah, Mother Nature as a whole is extremely anti-fragile, but the human body is also very, very anti-fragile as well in that we... Uh, you know, maybe we put ourselves through a bit of suffering by doing some exercise, whether it's a, some intense cardio or lifting heavy weights. 
in the short term, it's like a painful thing where you suffer a little bit, but then you grow and improve as a result. And that's at the individual level. But then also, if you take a step above that and look at anti-fragile systems, this is huge in startups and business, how they're the things that die off for the contribution to the whole entire economy as a whole. Yeah, the economy as a whole is really benefited by these high risk um, high risk startups that yes, in the in the short term they might die off themselves and they might fail, but in the long term, the ones that do work really add to the economy as a whole. Every time you use a coffee maker for your morning cappuccino or a latte, strong yeah, you are <laughs> almond latte for me. <laughs> you're benef- you're actually benefiting from the fragility of the coffee maker entrepreneur who failed. Because the entrepreneurship failure rate is at you know the high, like ninety percent or something in that area, and when every single one fails, they actually contribute to innovating in some kind of way, and then the one who survives uh, ends up with a very good coffee making machine yeah. that yeah. you can actually benefit from. Or it happens also in the building industry, for example. So if a building out there, if it falls down and is fragile, it contributes to anti fragility of cities. For example, Christchurch. Uh, I think in 2012, they had a massive earthquake and a lot of buildings went down, but they changed their design codes and all of a sudden the earthquake, every building being rebuilt had were, was a little bit better in terms of its robustness. Or even more topical in Australia and in England, there's been a lot of facade fires, um, which is a really bad thing in the short term, but it's making a lot of building codes all around the world really improve to have better buildings. So that's the setup to the book and an overview of the idea of anti-fragility. And so obviously anti-fragility is something that we want to court, something that we want to bring into our, our work, our lives, our, our health. Uh, we're always wanting to benefit from anti-fragility. But the next thing he talks about is that the modern world is really um, trying to eliminate anti-fragility. They're trying to smooth out all of the rough edges, all of these uh, unpredictable shocks. They're trying to make it nice and smooth and it feels safe, but really it's actually making us very fragile. He describes this type of person and after reading the book, you really see that they're absolutely everywhere as the fragilista. So you could have fragilista parents, for example. And they might be taking away their babies and their toddlers away from the dirt and protecting them from all the germs out there just because they really don't want them to get sick. But they're really making their kids and babies really fragile because they're not giving them the opportunity to have the cost in the short term of sickness to actually develop a very good long-term immunity to all the diseases out there to set them up to be much more healthier later in life. Yeah, exactly. The parents think they're doing the right thing by keeping their kid out of the dirt and the grass and all of the, the different things that could make them sick. But really, they're making them more fragile because later in life, their immune system isn't as strong. They can't cope with these things. Another thing that we're sort of doing now is that we're, you know, we're never bored. We're never disconnected. We've always got something that we can do to keep us entertained. And in the short term, it feels like that's a good thing. We're not bored. We're not suffering. Uh, but in the long term, it means that you know maybe we're eroding our memory, we're eroding our concentration, we can't focus, we can't get into deep work that Cal Newport talks about. And so we're losing some of those things by trying to make it safe and happy all the time. Mm. And another one we're going to keep coming back to um, in the episode is just being sheltered and not really taking any risks because you're scared of change because those risks that you take with those minimal costs will add up to provide new opportunities in the long term which are going to help you but if you just stay the same and be stagnant you're actually becoming much more fragile because when the next piece of volatility that enters your life you're actually going to uh, be much more um, vulnerable to be hurt in a much bigger way yeah Taleb illustrates this with with two lions their cousins ones uh, in the African savannah in you know running around chasing down wildebeest Mm. might go a couple of days without eating and then it has to work really hard to chase down a food and then it, it feasts for a couple of days uh, and it's a it seems like a tough life. But then when you compare that to his cousin who's in the zoo in New York who gets fed on a regimented schedule, doesn't really have much space to run around, uh, it's a pretty sad looking line in the zoo. Yeah. yeah, I think that analogy, man, is really, it matches really well back to that parent analogy, right? And uh, kids growing up, if they're so protected from failure and losses and they're given participation medals for you know, running in every single race, 
when they actually enter the real world and the big wild out of the zoo into the into the jungle of the Amazon, mate, they're pretty cooked, aren't they? Yeah. Because the first time that they apply for a job or something and they realize that they're, they suck relative to a whole bunch of other peers, you know, they're, they're much more fragile to be absolutely taken slaughtered basically yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and this is so this is what taleb calls the tragedy of modernity so it says you know all the modern world all around us everything's becoming easier we're removing the variability we're removing the volatility so our life is nice and and comfortable and safe and flat you know we're, we're not suffering from big troughs of negative downside and it feels like it's probably a good thing but mm. he's saying that in the long term it makes us really, really susceptible to these negative black swan events that could come out of nowhere and, and destroy you. Yeah. The profession that's most guilty after reading this book of being fragilistas is uh, doctors and everyone in medicine in general. So if you've got a kid or a child and you bring him into the doctor and he's, you know, waking up at night all the time and he's drawing on the walls and he's really... <laughs> Sounds like a little shit. little shit, basically. <laughs> taking the doctor and the doctors, you know, they're they're incentivized to actually do something to provide, prescribe some kind of solution. So they're, a lot of them, what Taleb says is they invent psychiatric diseases. They say, oh, it's ADHD or it's depression. And what they'll do is they medicate this child on some kind of some kind of drug like an antidepressant like Prozac. And what they're basically doing is rather than letting them out of the cage to actually um, experience things and do the natural thing that the body is trying to do or evolve evolved and you know the anti-fragility of evolution has made us in this thing you're basically putting them back into the cage again and you and you're creating all this long-term harm that is really unaccounted for in that one doctor's consultation visit yeah that idea of not doing nothing is a is a big one in that the doctor feels like they have to you know justify their massive salary and they feel like they have to do something so maybe if you you know you're a 55 year old bloke who's been driving trucks for the last 30 years and you go in with a very sore back and the doctor you know if the doctor says you know there's a few stretches you can do and if you give it you know six to 12 months and you give it a bit of rest and give it a bit of time it can probably heal itself Hmm. Um, that doctor is not going to get a big big pay packet out of that no it's they're probably much more likely to say mate your back's cooked let me take uh let me do some very risky uh expensive surgery on the back I might make you paralyzed, but there's, oh, I'm going to fix it and it's going to cost you a shitload of money. <laughs> Can you imagine the, the truck driver going to the doctor and then the doctor doing the right thing, just saying, no, you're better off just copping the pain? Yeah. Sometimes that is the, that is the, the best outcome because the doctor's visit should be seen as probabilistic benefits minus probabilistic costs. Mm. And sometimes the risk of harm of the healer can be overlooked. That's so depending on how you account for it, Medicine has a largely negative balance sheet. Going to the doctor increases your chance of death in some circumstances, he says. He says that, he says that um, deaths from doctors actually outstrip deaths from any single type of cancer in that you know, going to hospital, taking some kind of risky surgery that there's a small margin for error and if they make a slip, it's game over or you know, you've, you've opened up your body and in a hospital, you're susceptible to infection. There's all these things that sometimes being operated upon actually is a hell of a lot more risky than just leaving it. Yeah, they're really up to no good in, in, in some way. Sorry if there's any doctors <laughs> listening. You know, Someone might have a cold, they go to the doctor, they're prescribed antibiotics, fixes the cold, stuffs up their immune system in the long term. And then, you know, there's uh, these, these strains of diseases that are really becoming resistant to antibi- antibiotics in, in the long run as well. So, um, and a lot of these things which are long term don't get accounted for in the short term. Another really guilty fragilista that is really parading around the world is the central bank's who you know in, in control of the, the currencies and, and interest rates and who are trying to really make the short term okay and just save us there, but they're really opening us up to be really fucked up in the long term. Yeah, I don't think any politician or economist or you know financial leader wants to be responsible for short term pain. You know, it, no one no one wants to have a recession. Sometimes a recession might be needed. You know, it's like the a forest fire that clears out. Uh, some of the risk or some of the vulnerability that allows new growth to come through. 
Uh, sometimes in the economy, you might need that, but no politician wants to say, okay, let's go through a recession. We're going to have six to 12 months of pain, but it's going to come out better the other end. They just want everything to be growing all the time, everything positive, and they want to take the, the credit for a strong economy. So they're not willing to suffer the short-term pain that will help us in the long run. They just want to keep blowing up the bubble. That's right. So, you know, they don't want unemployment, for example, to rise short term. So they're always incentivized to, or currently, I don't know what it used to be like, but seemingly to keep lowering interest rates, um, not understanding that at some stage a, a crisis will come. And when it does come, there are no bullets left in the in the, in the the holster to actually solve the problem when it comes. So if the crisis comes now when there's record low interest rates around the world, I mean, it's just going to be more QE, more debt, um, for future generations and more just kicking the can down the road and being more vulnerable to a much bigger financial collapse of potentially the whole system if it uh, keeps becoming more fragile in the direction that it is. So that's all the different types of players, I guess, in the in the world that are thinking they're doing the right thing by by taking these actions to try and smooth out the volatility and variability and they're thinking that they're making everything safer but really what they're doing, they're actually making us more vulnerable to big negative shocks that could come down the road that we won't be able to cope with. So there are moves that make you more fragile and this is what the fragile list is really specialized at. But there are some moves that you can also do to benefit from anti-fragility. And what he talks about is optionality and how you should be exploiting asymmetric options with a lot of upside but limited downside. So when it comes to optionality, understanding that fragility, this implies that there's more to lose than to gain. It equals more downside than upside and it equals unfavorable asymmetry. But anti-fragility, it implies more to gain than to lose and equals more upside than downside. And this equals favorable asymmetry. So obviously from those definitions, obviously you want anti-fragility. You want those uh, as low downsides as possible and as high upsides as possible. And so what he says is we want variability so all the fragilistas we're talking about they're trying to smooth out the world and they're eroding variability but we actually want variability variability is actually good for you we actually as humans we actually benefit from variability yes variability means that there are there is going to be some kind of pain there's going to be a few short-term losses but in the long term we really want that variability so that we can uh, grow because we are as humans anti-fragile. So if you don't have any variability in your life there's no there's going to be no circumstances that open up that has upside or downside. The more variability that you have in your life the more opportunities you get to exploit things that are anti-fragile with high upside and minimal downside. Um, I think last season I used to. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this in the notes. I was waiting for this. Yeah, I, uh, I use the metaphor of you know a monkey. If you've got a lot of variability in your life, you're going to have these a lot of vines swinging over to you as a monkey, and you can decide. All right, this vine, it's on its downward slope. I'm going to jump up, and if I want to get to the top of the tree, I can jump on this vine because it's only got upside to it. Um, if you've got no vines coming, you're not going anywhere. But with a lot of vines coming through, you can select more different vines with that upside potential. And then you're going to climb up the top of the tree where all the, the lovely bananas are just sitting there <laughs> waiting for you um, in a much faster rate than all your peers. <laughs> I remember, I think it was in our 200th episode. It must have been about two months ago that you first uh, brought this, uh, this story, this idea, this example up. And I said, man, I think you need to simmer on this and try and work it out a little bit more before Do we I get to the anti-fragile episode. I added the, the, the bananas to the analogy. I think it still needs work. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit better. It was a bit cleaner. But yeah, I think, I think it needs, uh, needs a bit more work. I think I just need to keep bringing it up. <laughs> you'd, you'd love that, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd love that one. <laughs> so the best strategy, like the monkey that has many vines coming towards <laughs> it, the best strategy is to have options. So in, uh, I guess, the, the financial world, if you, if you buy an option... If you're the buyer or the holder of this option, it means you have the, uh, the opportunity or the right to buy something, but you don't have the obligation to buy something. So say it's a stock, an option means if it's looking good, you're able to purchase it. And if it doesn't look good, if, this, if the price goes down, you don't have to buy it. So that's what we're sort of looking for in life, that we've got this limited downside that if it's not working, we don't have to force ourselves to go towards it. But if it does look like the right thing to do, we're able to go towards it. So that's the best strategy for life is to have all of these options with limited downside and uh, asymmetric upside. And an example of 
uh, where you might be able to exploit optionality. For example, say if you are a tenant of a rent-controlled apartment in New York, you have the option in a few ways. So you can really stay as long as you want, but with no obligation to do so. So because it's controlled, on one hand, on one hand, if the rents increase enormously and there's this like bubble-like explosion of, of rent, you are really protected because you are where you stay, the rent controlled, it's not moving anywhere. But on the other hand, if rents collapse and go all the way downwards, you can easily just switch apartments. So in that case, having that rent controlled apartment, you're protected from the downside of the explosion, but you can exploit the upside if the rents around that same area decrease. So what we've learned a lot so far in this episode is all about fragility, robustness, anti-fragility, and it exploiting anti-fragility with the use of an option. You can use all this to really benefit yourself in the career that you are in or the career that you want to move into. I do like in Taleb's writing how he always he creates these wild characters yeah. to explain these. So we've got these two brothers, um, twin brothers, identical twins actually from Cyprus and they moved to London. So uh, one's called uh, Yanni who goes by John these days. Yeah. And one's called Georgios, who goes by George these days. So anyway, we've got it was <laughs> <laughs> unnecessary build up. We've got John and George. <laughs> so so uh, they're both living in London and John is is a banker. He's sort of like you're just a sort of mid-level manager. He's been working at the same bank for 25 years and George is a taxi driver. So John believes he's got this perfectly predictable income. Every single month, he gets exactly 3,082 pounds deposited into his bank account after tax. He's got his fixed mortgage. He's got his bills that are pretty much the same every month. He's got a little bit that he saves and puts away for a rainy day. And then, you know, just his normal discretionary spending throughout the month. You know, he wakes up most Saturday mornings, has a bit of a relax, has a coffee, reads the paper, and he's thinking life is good. Uh, he thinks he's got this safe, stable job where it's very predictable and very safe. He gets the exact same amount of money every single day. Compared to George, who thinks he's got no job security because he's a taxi driver. Sometimes he makes hundreds of pounds in a day. Sometimes he can barely even cover his own expenses. Sometimes he has a lot of fares. Sometimes he's got none. It's very volatile. It's very variable. And he often complains to his brother, Man, I've got this tough job where you know, it's, sometimes I make a lot of money. Sometimes I make none. I feel like I've got no job security. But it probably averages out that they actually get pretty similar incomes um, throughout the year. But from day to day, it's very variable. So John there, the banker, he's in a career that is absolutely fragile to the max and is completely unaware of it. Because if something like a banking crisis hit and he's sitting there with his huge huge mortgage and he's used to going partying at the Barbados uh, every, <laughs> every spring, I think that's, I don't know if it's good weather in spring, but let's just assume it is. I reckon, actually, I reckon John's the type of guy who wouldn't mind holidaying in Thailand. <laughs> getting a few massages. I think he'd be getting a few massages in, in Thailand as well. But if something hit like that, then he's really cooked because he's left with a whole bunch of debt and can't really do anything. But the taxi driver, because of the volatility, if something big hits, it's not going to really hurt him so much. So the taxi driver in that sense, he's not going to get slaughtered by the big next financial crisis. He's actually going to be robust to big things like that. Yeah, John feels safe. He's in this nice, big, safe company. He's, he's got a lot of uh, career there. He's, he's been there for 25 years. But the risk is with one simple phone call from HR, uh, his income could literally go to zero. Mm. And being a 50-year-old bloke, being at the same company for 25 years, he probably hasn't really been working on his skills. It's going to be very hard for him to find a new job. So he's got like one big employer who he's really at the mercy of. He has to pretty much do whatever he's told and... Overnight, he could his income could go to zero. Whereas George, he's got a hell of a lot of very, very small employers. Each customer is effectively his employer and no one customer really holds power over him. And if, uh, you know, for whatever reason, 20% of the people stop taking taxis, his income's never going to go to zero. This is the essential illusion in life that we've got, that randomness is risky, that it's a really bad thing and that eliminating randomness is done by eliminating randomness. Yeah. What's mate, that mean? It's a confusing sentence. It took me three goes to read it today I when I was doing the notes. But he's saying that, so you might think, okay, John, George has got randomness as the taxi driver. He's got randomness in his, uh, in his employers, in terms of the people he picks up, in terms of the, the wage, in terms of the day-to-day. And John thinks, okay, I'm going to eliminate all randomness 
and I'm going to go and work somewhere that's safe and comfortable and have one employer and I get the same amount every single paycheck. But by eliminating randomness, he's actually made himself vulnerable to the big randomness of the negative black swan, which is the banking crisis. The whole economy crashes and he's completely cooked. Mm. So in the category of robust, you got taxi drivers, you got prostitutes, you got carpenters, you got dentists, you got plumbers, you got tailors. All these people have a lot of sources of income from a whole range of different clients that are robust to some of those big black swans that's a highly improbable but highly impactful to hit you for six. Yeah, and they, they have risks, but they know exactly what their risks are. Their risks are very visible. You know, their risks are if uh, you're a tradie and you hurt your back, then you can't work for two weeks. That's a big risk, obviously. Or if there's a, a, a storm or a flood and, uh, and you can't work, there's, there's all these risks there that are very visible. But when you're an employee, the risks are hidden and completely unexpected. You've got no control over the economy that could completely destroy your income. So we don't like this one type of randomness or risk, which are these small daily fluctuations. You know, sometimes you make a couple hundred bucks, sometimes there are hardly any fares. So we've built all these systems around it to make everything more stable and more steady. We go and become an employee at a nice safe institution to remove that small daily fluctuation or that risk. But unfortunately, although we've protected ourselves against these small variabilities, We've actually made these larger variabilities, these potential negative black swans, significantly more severe. So it's a, a real risk. And so Taleb says that the more variability you see in a system, actually the less black swan prone it is. So if there's more variability, it's less likely to suffer from a big negative black swan. So John was fragile and he's going to get cooked up when the next um, black swan of a financial crisis hits. George is robust. He's pretty safe to a lot of events like that. But there are also professions out there that are actually anti-fragile. And what goes in this category would be um, professions like the author, the podcaster, the artist, and some business owners and entrepreneurs as well. Say for an author, there might be a, an option with upside and low downside in being controversial. Because when you're in these professions, the number of people who dislike your work don't count. Mm. But the people who really love your work do count. So if you're really controversial and you appeal to 1% of the audience who, uh, you know, and you get your 1,000 true fans, there's big upside to that. So if you take that risk and get out of the outside the comfort zone and you look a bit different, you might appeal to some audience. And then the people who hate you, there's no negative of buying the book. It's not like they can just take 20 bucks from you because they hate you so much. So that's something that has, a, has an option inside that in being controversial. Yeah, Taleb says don't be mildly acceptable or commendable. Having 100% of people thinking you're acceptable and you're you know, just not too bad is pretty useless to you. But if you've got 98% of people who vehemently hate you and 2% of people who are obsessed with you, that's a far better position to be in because they're more likely to buy than someone who just thinks you're all right. It's these professions that you can actually access a lot of volatility and uh, optionality and you could potentially even get you know, like a, a positive black swan where you get a massive upside enter into your into your life and into your business or whatever you might be doing. So as we come towards the, the end of the book, we've discussed all of the, the theory and the ideas and the illustrations behind it. Uh, a few of the things that we pulled out that were, were a very important takeaways is firstly, you need to spot options. Options are all around us. And I think a lot of the time we're very blind to the amount of options that we do have. So to have options entering your life, what you need is asymmetry plus rationality. So you need to actually have the brain to spot the option and spot the opportunity that might be lurking around you. A lot of the time, the option hides where we don't want it to hide. So they might be around you every day just in plain sight, but you're really option blind and you can't really see it. For example, some people might have a boss out there who is a certain type of character. And if you ask them for a pay rise, it might be neutral their reaction to the pay rise. So there's no real downside there. And then the, the upside is really that you might actually get the pay rise. And, and so that's an option right there. And you might have that every single day that you haven't really thought of, but it's something you can just pull out. Another option, because we always want options, options are a good thing. Another option in the work setting is, I think, to suggest a, a new idea or a new way of doing things or like a new project that you could take on. If you uh, were able to present it well and say, hey, I've come up with this idea. I've noticed that for... A, B, and C reason, we could do X project uh, and it could benefit us long term. 
I think that's a great option in that the, the downside is that you look pretty good for taking a bit of initiative uh, and it doesn't happen. And then the upside is obviously you've added a whole new option and a whole new string to your bow. And I think that's just where the, the options are there where you don't want them to be because doing something like that has big upside but it's really uncomfortable. Mm. But the reason it's upside is because no one else is doing it because it's uncomfortable and that's what makes it doing that thing scarce in the first place which makes it really valuable. And it's a similar thing if you're at a bar and say if you're single and there's someone out there who you're really attracted to, there's really no downside in going up and asking them for the number or asking to go out on a date sometime because you're never going to see him again. Mm. There's no real, you're just going to feel maybe a bit like an idiot, but that's fine. That'll, that'll go away. Mm. But there's massive upside. You don't know what this thing might turn out, turn out into. Yeah, so obviously that's these are all the types of things we need to start identifying around us. So around us all the time, these options that have an extremely low downside, but this uh, asymmetry in that there's almost no downside, but there's massive potential upside just by having this option. So these are the things we need to start recognizing and taking advantage of. Mate, I spotted one um, a few weeks ago. I was asked to speak at a conference and there was you know like 12 speakers there at the day and it was uh, the Green Building Council of Australia and, you know, everyone who speaks at these kind of conferences are just kind of run the mill doing the same similar kind of thing. And I've never really done a joke in a presentation um, to a, a good extent. But I thought if I take a risk and try and do a really funny joke, there's a big upside to that um, and little downside because there's no point, as Taleb says, is just being mildly commendable because there's no upside in just being run of the pack. So if I did the joke and it doesn't fall off, maybe I'll look like an idiot, but there's no real... Not, not a massive downside to an idiot, but there's a big upside to actually uh, stepping up on, in, on top of everyone else in presenting for the day. And mate, if you're curious about the result, it, um, <laughs> it really didn't fit this narrative at all because it was a mildly commendable joke. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, um, and it was a Game of Thrones joke with a spoiler in there and I just pissed some people off. So it was actually... <laughs> there was some downside. <laughs> after that set up, there was probably some downside and, and no real upside, but that's all right. <laughs> but I think like even taking risks in presentations is an, is an option in itself. Um, I actually was listening to a podcast Rachel Botsman was on, who was on our show previously. She said that every time she does a presentation, she always like tries, takes a risk. She always tries something different in that she'll leave space, like 10% of space to take a risk and do something different. So there's the, obviously the, the downside is it doesn't work, but that's not really too much of a downside because she's got a very strong 90% of her presentation. And then the upside is she finds something that really, really clicks or that really, really mm. works well. Uh, and that's the upside. And I, I'm surprised we haven't used the word tweak in tinker. this episode. Or tinker. Tinker, yeah. Well, that's, that's the one that you dropped all the time, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because it yeah, didn't, didn't make it in this episode so far. But that's really all it is. It's there's When you tinker and keep changing things and tweaking things, you really got the option in just tweaking because if you tweak and it doesn't work, then you can just stay where you are. Mm. But if you tweak and it does work, you take that upside and then you move up a level. So, you know, in everything you do, it's something that you should be thinking about is just keep on tweaking. Like last week, we did that Dr. Seuss episode. Mm. Um, that was something new, a new different style for us. If we get good feedback on that, we can add that to our top of episode we do in future. We can do more kids' books. And if we get bad feedback, then we just don't do an episode like that ever again. Yeah. That's a, mate, that's a very good example. Maybe so give us feedback to people we haven't really got much. <laughs> <laughs> mate, our, our good friend Matt from California, did you see all the, the books he sent through? He did, yeah. No, I love so it. There's, mate, there's, that, plenty, there's plenty there that we could do in future uh, if that went down all right. Uh, mate, the second a big takeaway, sort of flowing on nicely from this idea of tinkering and tweaking that may or may not work, is that errors are really just an investment. So, you know, as you said, if you tinker and if it doesn't work, it's really an investment in your future as opposed to some kind of uh, massive disaster. So when you're engaging in these tinkering, you're going to incur a lot of these small losses and these small investments. And then once in a while, you're going to find something huge, which is going to be fantastic. As an example, he says in the book, there's actually a whole lot of half invented and half invented ideas out there that are just waiting to be discovered. For example, 6,000 years ago, someone invented the wheel. And then it took that long for someone to realize that the people going through airports, carrying these really heavy luggage on their back, that if someone just connected these two discoveries and put a wheel on this luggage, then they've got one of the best inventions of the 21st century, 20th century, arguably. There is a category out there of things that are just half invented. And if you were to just tweak and tinker, 
there might be just a real breakthrough they're just waiting out there and sometimes you need a visionary to figure out what to do with this discovery to take it forward yeah absolutely it's a that's a very very important one is that you know by tinkering yes of course you're going to make some errors but every error you make is really a step towards finding the the right answer and you just if you keep tinkering uh it's really an investment for the future uh the third thing that he talks about and will be extremely remiss of us not to talk about this it's probably one of probably his most well-known idea is this barbell strategy and i think if you've uh, read or listened to any of nasim taleb you would have heard of this barbell strategy so in the barbell strategy if you think about a barbell that weightlifters use is going extreme to both ends so in one sense you really want to be extreme risk aversion on one side and extreme risk loving on the other side so this being completely different to the person who is a moderate risk taker and has all the weight in the middle. Mm. So for example, you might be someone who has somewhat of a very safe job on your Monday to Friday and you know that's very risk averse and you're just quite safe there. But at the same time, you might have something really speculative that you're pursuing on the side that potentially could bring in a, a positive black swan into your life. Yeah, most certainly. And say like in the investing world where Nassim comes from, obviously if your barbell, you want something at, at either end of the bar with a, a lot of gap in between and you don't want to be messing around with that middle ground. So you want something extremely, extremely, extremely safe. So maybe in your portfolio, it's your, your cash or treasury bonds, extremely, extremely safe. And then a very small portion is extremely, extremely, extremely speculative and risky. And so you, you don't mess around with that stuff in the middle that gives you average re- returns. You want... Most of your portfolio that's super safe and then a small chunk that's extremely risky and open to those positive black swans. The fourth takeaway we're leaving with is that curiosity is anti-fragile in general because if you're curious and you're seeking new information, you're probably going to have these little mini deaths of what you know now and if you're thinking back to Hydra, you're going to be chopping off a little bit of what you do know to uh, you know, insert in new ideas, new paradigms into your life. Uh, a lot of people that I come across, they have these really smart sounding answers to a lot of solutions and once they reach that point, they've got this smart answer, they, they just sit with that and they're, they're probably not going to learn anything new whereas if you open yourself up to actually have that beginner's mind and that empty cup idea, then you can actually always grow in terms of what you understand in the world. Yeah, curiosity and learning is like an addiction. Uh, anytime you try to satisfy it, it just becomes magnified and that every time you learn something, uh, you learn more that you still need to learn in terms of every time that you find something out, it just opens more and more doors or presents you with more and more vines that you need to learn and to swing swing past. I don't think the monkey thing sort of fit, fit too well there. But uh, it is that idea that every time you learn something new, you just find that there's actually more to learn. And it's this uh, positive, virtuous cycle of learning more and more and more and try to satisfy this curiosity, which just gives you more and more curiosity. So that's the book. What we learned about was uh, fragility, fragilistas and the people who make everything fragile and make us more vulnerable to big crises and the opposite of that being anti-fragility and how we can actually benefit it from in in a lot of ways whether it be our health our career or business and some of the takeaways in the book um, seeing areas as investments spotting options barbell strategy and just being curious to actually you know go about the world in in a curious manner so you can actually benefit from upside and limit the downside. 